Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Rabbi Emanuel. Shabbat Shalom. Let me start with a little bit of information that we all should have in our heads. This day, in 1948, just before the expiration of the British mandate in Palestine, David Ben-Gurion and the Jewish People's Council proclaimed the establishment of the State of Israel. I thought that would fit perfectly with the introduction to this, this week's message. This week's reading is an extension of the theme of Kedoshim. It was dictated by Adonai, and like all scriptures dictated by Elohim, it is living because it speaks, it speaks of things present, but it also carries forward into the future. More, which translated means speak. Both Imor and Kiddushem are an amazing call to those set apart by the Father to receive the call to service. First to Israel as a whole, later to Jews after returning from Babylon through Ezra, and now to both Jews and the disciples of Yeshua in the Messianic Assembly. To the Messianic Assembly, as many as follow Yeshua, there is a special blessing because we have been covered by the blood of our Messiah. Are there Christians who are covered by the blood of Messiah? Well, of course there are. Just as there are Jews who hold it in their hearts that Yeshua is the promised Messiah and coming King. Some even in our area who are having to come together and learn about Yeshua for the first time, including women in a, in a very orthodox community who for the first time are allowed to learn about the scriptures. How do we know who Yeshua believing Christians are? Well, there's a few signs. First, they call our Messiah's name Yeshua. Or you may hear them flip back and forth to Jesus, depending on who they're speaking to. They also follow the commandments, including the Sabbaths given in this reading. It's just not enough to say, I believe, or I'm saved. And then ignore the, remember, and ignore the command to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it. The Sabbath day is fixed and well known. I once did a study of the days of the weeks of ancient cultures. Nearly all of them called the seventh day of the week some variation of the word Sabbath. Not one of them use Sabbath on Friday or Sunday. We need to keep always in our minds that we live under a variation of Roman influence. I'm not talking about modern day Rome or not in day Italy. I'm talking about the empire. We use their names for our months, our days, and the days of the early Roman church, they integrated many of their holidays to replace God's days. And this happened long before the Roman church became the leading minds of the Western communities, of the Western countries. Let me give you a few, a few examples. Estore might sound familiar. It was a spring goddess who was, uh, was celebrated in the spring during vernal equinox, or as Anglo-Saxons preferred to call her, Easter. And to this day, Easter is used by the Christian community to replace the word Pesach, or Passover. Saturnalia was a winter feast to the Roman god Saturn, for whom we owe Saturday. This feast coincides with our present day shopping season and ends on December 25th. Of course, that holiday has another name as well. The big one, Sunrise Sunday. It was used to replace the Sabbath. But understand, it was more ancient than the Romans and the Greeks. It had been, it had been practiced by pagans for centuries before. Adonai calls sun worship an, an abomination. Ezekiel states it this way in his writings. He said to me, have you seen this son of man? You will again see even greater abominations than these. 
So he brought me into the inner court of Adonai's house. Behold, at the door of the temple, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of Adonai and their faces toward the east. And they were bowing in worship eastward toward the sun. That's in Ezekiel 8, 15 through 16. In the fourth century, some 400 years after Yeshua, Eusebius, a bishop of the early Christian church, enforced a new law stating, all things whatsoever that it was duty to do on the Sabbath, these we have transferred to the Lord's day as they had began to call Sunday. With an enforceable law came persecutions against the very people whom God set apart for himself. Cardinal Gibbons, Archbishop of Baltimore, in 1876 in his book, Faith of Our Fathers, said, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. This is a American archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church stating you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. That's amazing. Now I can't condemn those who taught this way and I can't condemn those who still practice it. I don't have that authority. But there will come a day when Adonai will send out a call to all believers to come out of these festivals and to return to Yeshua, to his consecrated days. I'm merely making it clear that the God of Israel has established a day for his people to worship and to praise his name and to assemble. We too, in the Messianic community, were set apart and commanded to become holy because Adonai is holy. That means we keep the commandments and proclaim the testimony of Yeshua. I remember reciting this as a child, but I won't do that because it's the King James. I'll read it to you from the, the uh, CJB. Remember the day, Shabbat, to set it apart for God. You have six days to labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath for Adonai, your God. On it, you are not to do any kind of work, not you, your son or your daughter, not your male or female slaves, not your livestock, and not the foreigner staying with you inside the gates to your property. For in six days, Adonai made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, but on the seventh day, he rested. This is why Adonai blessed the day, Shabbat, and separated it for himself. You can find that in Exodus 20. It's the longest of the commandments. And yet the whole world has turned to the day of the sun. But we who are grafted into the children of Israel are to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. Because God consecrated the seventh day. He set it apart. And he is holy. Adonai equally consecrated the Sabbaths, the holy days, commanded in this reading. We say we believe a lot of things. The real proof, as James says, the works, or as Yeshua calls it, the fruits, are the proof of our belief. When I was a child, I was especially hard-headed. My mother put pots in the stove, and I saw that blue flame of natural gas coming up over the top. I saw the smoke rising from the boiling pots. My mother saw that I noticed these quiet flames as well. Now keep in mind, I'm just a little child, and I was in one of those walkers, as they used to call them back in the old days, when they put a baby in a walker and they would bounce around the room on wheels. My mother was so, she noticed this and she said to me, fire. Don't touch it. It will burn you. I shook my head, acknowledging. I think I might have even believed it at that tender age. 
Then one day, while her back was turned, I reached out to touch the flames in the burner. I screamed and pulled my hand back. From that day forward, I've had a healthy fear of sticking my hands in fire. You could say, now I believe it, and I keep that knowledge. Of course, being hard-headed, I went on to experiment with gravity and electronics. I, I used to like to take things apart. Let's just say I earned valuable respect for gravity, and we won't go into that. It's not a good story. And I learned a valuable respect for electronics, especially transformers and tubes. Like the fire incident, those lessons came with a healthy dose of pain. Does that sound familiar to how God revealed the Sabbath to their for, to former Israelite slaves? He sent them out in the fields to collect manna. And those who took too much, tried to keep it till the next day, it spoiled. But on the Sabbath day, on a Friday, when they went out to collect, he told them to keep it. And they kept it for the next day, and it did not spoil. He reached them through their bellies. Having now kept the Sabbath for many years, I can now see and feel the blessings of keeping the Sabbath. The blessings are burned into my heart. You can say into my body as well. Friday as the sun begins to set, whether it's rainy or cloudy, I look up in the sky and I can feel the Sabbath coming. My mind and my body begin to relax. There's a literal release. When I resist that release by allowing my mind to run rampant or distracting myself on Friday night, then my sleep suffers and I cheat myself out of the blessings of shalom, of shalom that the Sabbath gives. Yeshua knew we as humans cannot follow his holiness, not on our own. Yeshua said this way to his disciples, but it rings true today. Stay awake and pray that you will not be put to the test. The spirit is indeed eager, but human nature is weak. Matthew 26, 41. It's not that we lack willpower or desire, it's because our sinful nature is waging war inside of us. The world gives us a generous helping of values, political sides, desires for wealth and success, even telling us we're too fat, you're too thin, too short, you're not pretty enough. Our young people are tempted by these things as well. They're tempted to fit in, to be non-conforming, to stand out from the crowd, to try this new thing, or to publicize ourselves and our bodies, to look for approval from the masses. I can't count how many people have killed themselves because they didn't receive approval from those who were in their list of, their list of so-called friends. Believing parents have to engage with their children to be a part of their lives, to look at them, to see what they're doing, not to condemn them, not to chase them away, but to celebrate God's uniqueness in them. As caretakers of God's young ones, we need to look at our children's strengths and encourage their gifts. My mother knew I loved learning and she bought the entire Encyclopedia Britannica, which was about the price of a car back in the old days. And my, my living room was filled with books. She just fed it and, and fed it and fed it. But you know what? No two, children, no two children are alike, just like no two adults are alike. This is the multifaceted nature of God being expressed in the world through us. Our only hope is the indwelling of the Ruach HaKodesh, our Holy Spirit. That same spirit that was in Yeshua without measure. But we have to want it. We have to crave it. We have to ask the Father for it. And seek ways to be like Yeshua. Reading in Matthew, keep asking and it will be given to you. Keep seeking, you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. 
For everyone who keeps asking receives. He who keeps seeking finds. And to him who keeps knocking, the door will be open. Is there anyone here who, if his son asks him for a loaf of bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? These, these words are echoed in the statements of, in the book of James. You have been set apart by God the Father because you are special to him. Okay. I don't want you to hear this as a sermon or a drosh. I want you to hear this as a message. You have been set apart by the Father because you are special to him. A unique expression of God made in his image. He wants you to reach out and serve others. First in your families, then in the household of God, and eventually the broader earth. In this week's reading alone, God says some 13 times, be holy because he is holy. Each one of those declarations is preceded by an example. Like not eating animals that died naturally or torn by wild animals. Okay, well, we say we don't have to worry about that because we live in a modern world. We go to a supermarket. But I say scrutinize what you choose in the supermarkets. Choose kosher animals, kosher foods, because they have been inspected by men whose license comes from God. Offer sacrifices that are acceptable, free of defect. That's, I'm going to touch on that a little later. Not profane the name of the Lord. Don't be tempted to say, oh, Jesus, don't use those names. Even though we know that his name is Yeshua, the people around us hear that name and they think, our Lord, keeping a complete rest on the Sabbath, from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. If you have to, turn off the TV, find a book and read, listen to music, relax your mind, keep a complete rest on the Sabbath. Keep Pesach, not that other holiday. Waving the sheaf on the first day, on the first Sabbath after the start of Pesach. Now, we don't do that today. We do it by counting the Omer, which was a commandment that Yeshua gave to his disciples as well. To count the Omer, to count the days. Count the days, he said, and then gather and that was that day that they were waiting for, that they were counting down toward. It was called Shavuot. Keep Shavuot and join the Holy Convocation. That means come together. Blowing of the shofars, Rosh Hashanah. Keeping the feast of Yom Kippur. Keeping the feast of Sukkot for seven days. Keeping the commanded assembly on the eighth day of Sukkot. Keeping the mitzvah and obeying them. Now some of you might say, well, those verses apply to the priest, the Levites or the children of Israel. I heard as much when I was taught as a child in Catholic school. I was told uh, subtly and even blatantly that Israel failed to remain faithful, to remain set apart. So God cast them out and instead raised up a church. This is a direct contradiction to the Holy Scriptures. Going to a Jesuit Catholic school, I had problems with this kind of thinking. Remember all those books that uh, my parent, my mother gave me? Well, I had lots of Bibles and I read them. I read what was called, as um, Maharat mentioned, the Old Testament, which is not old, which is still in effect. I read those books. And so when I heard it in school and I heard it in Protestant churches, I would a little grimace a little bit, you know, lift my shoulders up and kind of rinse my nose because I knew that that's not biblical. Nowhere in the Holy Scriptures does it say any church 
was raised up to replace the set apart holiness calling of Israel. Nowhere. The God of Israel reigns and the lion of the tribe of Judah will reign on this earth again. In fact, the books of the prophets, the words of Yeshua, and the apostle to the Gentiles, the much maligned, much hated Pharisee, Paul, the lawyer, he reinforces the same call of Israel and Judah. And he emphasized that others will be grafted on to Israel and Judah, predicting those of us to this day. Now, let me, let's try and do a rereading of Paul. Paul said in Romans 11, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I, too, am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he knew beforehand. Or do you not know what the scripture says about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? The Israel at that time were backsliding and worshiping Baal and a number of other gods. Adonai, they have killed your prophets. They have destroyed your altars. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So in the same way, also at this present time, there has come to be a remnant according to God's gracious choice. Who's he talking about here? That remnant was populating the early church. They were Jews. And they were mixed with Gentiles. But it is by God's grace. It is no if it's but if it is by grace, it is no longer by works. We'll talk about that. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So what then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained. But the elect obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes not to see and ears not to hear, until this very day. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they do not see and bend their back continually. I say then, Paul, returning, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their false step, salvation has come to the Gentiles. He didn't say fall. He said their false step. reading of them it was amazing and what I found what I just wanted to share with the other people in my class I wanted to say look I went to the other pastors I said look you have to see this you have to read this they read it and they couldn't see it continuing on with Paul if the first fruit is holy so is the whole batch of dough and if the root is holy so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became a partaker of the root of the olive tree with its richness, do not boast against the branches. In other words, no Gentile can boast. But if you do boast, it is not you who support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, Branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True enough, Paul says. They were broken off because of unbelief. 
and you stand by faith. But do not be arrogant, but fear. He said this to the early Gentiles. Matter of fact, the people of Rome. If God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Notice then the kindness and severity of God. Severity toward those who fell, but God's kindness toward you. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise, you too will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off, for if you were cut off, that which is by nature a wild olive tree, and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? How much more will Jewish believers be added back to the tree, to the natural olive tree? That's in Romans 11. We know by many scriptures that the eyes of the children of Israel, both in the land of Israel and on the farthest flung corners of the earth, will be opened. And they will recognize their sacrificial lamb. And he will return as a powerful king, leading the armies of heaven. His feet will touch the Mount of Olives, and the mountain will split in two. What sits at the foot of the Mount of Olives today? I won't say it. I'll ask you to go to the maps and to look at it and see if it's not a point of contention for the children of Abraham to this day. I admit some of the things in Leviticus we cannot do without the Mishkan or the temple. But if you look at those words, you will see that many of those same things can and are fulfilled today by our actions. Offering sacrifices that are acceptable. What are those? There are several things. First, there are financial offerings to support the ministry, to support the people doing the work, to pay for the building, to keep sending out the emails, to keep paying for the things that keep us together as a community. And then there's the labor that it takes to put those things together for a Shabbat service and to take them down and put them away. Offering sacrifices that are acceptable. Keeping a complete rest on the Sabbath. Keeping the Lord's appointed times. You know, what Maharat read, what she chose out of the reading, fit perfectly with what I've written, and I did not talk to her about it. That just shows you that there's the same spirit. Counting of the Omer. Every night. These are, th these are just a few of the things that we need to do to begin to approach the request in this reading. I will also admit for centuries, people have used Paul's words to justify not keeping God's festivals. This I say personally, it just shows a, a remarkable lack of knowledge of history or a deliberate attempt to distort the truth. In the days of Paul and for years after, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of holidays, festivals. Each month could have as many as 12 or more holidays, birthdays, and feasts to every minor and major god in the pantheon. And the Romans celebrated the Greeks, the Greek gods, and they celebrated the gods of the East. When the Gentiles in places like Rome, Corinth, and Thessalonica came into believing Yeshua, many of them kept some of those days or rather slid back into them. Paul saw this and he wrote about it. The first place we'll look at is in Galatians. I want you to keep in mind who he's talking to. He's not talking to Jews. He's talking to the people of Galatia who are mostly Gentiles. But now you do know God and more than that, you are known by God. So how is it that you turn back again to these weak and miserable elemental spirits? Remember, the Roman gods worshipped everything from the wind to the trees to the grass. They were superstitious. They worshipped snakes. They worshipped birds. 
There was no limit to the number of gods that they had. That's not, that's in addition to the above, to the named gods of Apollo and Mercury and the others. Do you want to enslave yourselves to them once more? He asked the Gentiles. You observe special days, months, seasons, and years. All of those days. When, matter of fact, look at a Roman calendar. Try to get a hold of an ancient Roman calendar and look at the special days, the months, and the seasons, and the years. Paul said, I fear for you that my work among you has been wasted. Paul is speaking about all those pagan holidays. True to form, modern Christians have come to me and said, let me read you something. And they read that same passage to me. They thought it was about Jewish holy days. Paul's audience, Paul's audience was former pagans who used to celebrate every feast and birthday and every little holiday, almost every two days. <laughs> Look up that Roman calendar. You'll see what I mean. The holidays just trip over each other. What is remarkable is the people who use that, that same text to discard the holy days, they never get around to quoting what Paul also says, in, especially in 1 Corinthians. Reading in 1 Corinthians 1, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 5. Don't you know the saying, it only takes a little hummus to leaven a whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old hummus so that you can be a new batch of dough. Because in reality, you are unleavened. For Pesach lamb, our Pesach lamb, the Messiah, has been sacrificed. So let us celebrate the Seder. Not with leftover hummets, the hummets of, weak, of wickedness and evil, but with the matzah of purity and truth. Now I will admit that the word Seder was added into our, our Messianic versions. The word that he actually uses is celebrate the feast because Pesach is a feast. For our Pesach lamb, the Messiah, has been sacrificed. So let us celebrate the feast, not with leftover hummets, the hummets of wickedness and evil, but with the hummets of purity and truth. 1 Corinthians 5. How come no one, no Christian ever throws that up? Paul told the Gentiles to keep the feast of Pesach, so why is this not taught to, to the believers today? Why are they not taught to keep the feast? If Paul taught those early Christians to keep the Pesach holiday, you know he meant for them to keep all of God's holy days, including the weekly Sabbath. So guess for us, guess today what our spiritual battle is, what's being waged in us today. Number one, our offerings. Keeping the Sabbath holy and set apart from the rest of the week. Preparing the whole week for the Sabbath. Keeping the appointed Sabbaths. Those holy days. They're not meant for us to pick and choose. Let's see, I'll keep the, the weekly Sabbath and Yom Kippur. But maybe I can skip Shavuot. I just work a little bit on the eighth day of the feast. After all, we're only holding service. We're not holding any service that day. Counting the Omar every night in this season. Have you missed any days? You can get caught up. Guarding and building up our children and our, our teens against a world that wants to tear them down and make them victims. Let me read that one again. Guarding and building up our children and our teens against a world that wants to tear them down and make them victims. And the last one, although there are many, the last one I'll mention is building up and supporting one another in prayer, which this community has begun to do, and it's beautiful to see. And seeking to support your brothers and sisters with gentleness kindness and gratitude in speech and in deed. 
Yeshua knew we as humans could not follow his holiness on our own. He knew we needed heavenly help. He also knew that by praying that we stay in the world and seeking his help, we could grow stronger. It's not a coincidence that we find ourselves here. We were chosen just as the children of Israel were chosen. In the words of Peter, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and set apart by the Spirit for obeying Yeshua, the Messiah, and for the sprinkling with his blood, that special blessing I spoke of. Grace and shalom be yours in full measure. That's First Peter 1. Your being here was not chance, and your inheritance, as Peter said, later on in the same book, in the same text, is an incorruptible, undefined, unfolding inheritance that has been reserved in heaven. Put your mind around a few of those words for a moment. Incorruptible, undefined, without border, continually unfolding inheritance that has been reserved in heaven. Peter goes on to say, by trusting you are being protected by God's power. I have to repeat it. By trusting you who are listening, you who are here, are being protected by God's power for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. First Peter, that's 4 and 5. Peter also knew our lives would be difficult. For a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, he said in verse 6. He should lived a life free of sin, and he also fulfilled all of the injunctions of Kedeshim and Emor. He expects us to follow him in all his ways. Peter says in verse 15, On the contrary, following the Holy One who called you, become holy yourselves in your entire way of life. Yeshua knew we could not win this fight by sheer willpower or force of will because we war with our own human nature and we war against spiritual forces in high places. Following the Holy One who called you, become holy yourselves in your entire way of life since the Tanakh says you are to be holy because I am holy, says Peter. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have a sincere love for your brothers, love each other deeply with all your heart. Love your brother and your sister, even when they step on your foot, when they make you angry, when you want to curse, when you want to walk away, when you want to give up, when you get tired, and when you can't go on. Have a sincere love for your brothers and love each other deeply with all your heart. Don't be afraid, says the, are the words of Isaiah. I love this passage. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be distressed, for I am your God. I give you strength. I give you help. I support you with my victorious right hand. These are the words that he echoed all throughout this reading this week. He says that I am holy. And he says, I sanctify you. For I, Adonai, your God, say to you, as I hold your right hand, have no fear. I will help you. It is Adonai Elohim who makes us holy. And he has set us apart to do his work because we can't do it by ourselves. In conclusion, let me leave you with parts of the words that Titus delivered to the synagogue in Ephesus. There is one body and one spirit, just as when you were called to one hope. 
There is one Lord, one trust, one immersion, and one God, the Father of all, who rules over all, and works through all, and is in all. Ephesians 4. And going further, so imitate God as his dear children, and live a life of love, just as also the Messiah loved us. Indeed, on our behalf, he gave himself up as an offering, as a slaughtered sacrifice to God, with a pleasing fragrance. Ephesians 5, verse 1. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.